in this episode, we are going to be reviewing The Trial from 1962. This was directed by Orson Welles. He also adapted the screenplay from the book by Franz Kafka. Orson Welles also appeared in the film alongside Anthony Perkins, Jean Moreau, and Romy Schneider. Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a video YouTube podcast where we explore movies from all over the world and talk about how those stories were told on film. I want to welcome back writer and director Janae Rachel Ballo. She has done this incredible web series called Managed, and she also wrote a feature film on one of the stars of this film, Anthony Perkins, called Don't Fence Me In which I'm looking forward to seeing down the road. Janae, welcome back. Thanks so much for doing this. We're keeping the streak going. Yeah, it's my pleasure again and again and again. And it'll be like for the thousands of <laughs> soon. So yeah. Happy awesome. No, I'm happy to have you because I always enjoy our talks. Uh, and I love that you're such a fan of, of Anthony Perkins. And the more I watch his films, the, mo the more I uh, see how good he is. Like, I always knew he was a good actor. He had certain strengths. But, I mean, this may be his one of his best performances. I mean, I haven't <laughs> seen all his films, but I just thought he's, like, he's remarkable in this. I don't know he's how you... Really good. Yeah. yeah, no, he's, he's really good. And, uh, you know, you, you know, I did, like, tons and tons of research uh, for writing Don't Fence Me In. Uh, the biopic on Perkins. And so I got, I got a few stuff about the trial uh, in my back pocket to share. Great. But it's definitely uh, that his performance is stellar. I mean, I remember one time uh, uh, one person told me that Orson Welles told Anthony to walk through the air or walk through, yeah, to walk as if you're walking through the thickest air. And that's what created his, this like stance that was very authoritative and oh, uh, interesting. yeah yeah I mean the performance is just really really good uh, yeah. down to even walk yeah yeah no I totally agree agree um I want to get more into the performances but I'm curious when you first saw this how did you feel about it at first and has it changed uh to how you feel now about it Ooh, uh, you always ask the good questions <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, when I watched this the first time, it's not that different. The trials, of, or if you have not read the book, it's Kafka, and it's just it's it's the most surreal thing in the world to watch. And if you're trying to look for answers, you, you're not going to get them. So when I was a little kid and I watched this, I was just I was jaw dropped uh, for reasons that I was just confused. But I was also really entranced by the fact that it's shot beautifully. It's so cinematic and the score and the performances, there's something there that lures you in, even though, it, because it's so elusive, yeah. it lures you in and there's no answers to be had. So you're kind of searching yeah. and that's what's beautiful about it. And that's the same thing it is today for me. I mean, I, I couldn't, I wish I could say like, well, as you know, with age comes wisdom, but no, not this time around. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just the same thing. Well, you know, that that's what makes it such a unique experience because it's, it's like the character goes mad and you sort of go mad trying to find like the meaning of it, which I think is the reason why there are so many interpretations of this film. So, I mean, it's anyone, whatever people come, can come up with can be valid so long as it's justified, I think. But I'm curious, like, do you, do, do you see this a certain way? Do you, do, you, do you think there's some kind of meaning behind it? Or what's your, like, how, what's what do you think it's about? My justified interpretation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. As I um, put it, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Um, I, I do love a justification. Um, so I... Yeah, I think that since there are no answers, there's some stuff in the, I, I kind of personalize it. So my person, personalized justification, interpretation, whatever it is. Um, we, I, I like the fact that 
in mm -hmm. life that there are sometimes you go through things that you cannot logically or emotionally or mentally, whatever, wrap your head around it. You just have to let it be. It's too wild. It's too crazy. It's too surreal that you just got to go, okay, the no answer is the answer. And yeah. that's what I like about this movie. And what I take away, the main takeaway is just like, just kind of step back and let things unfold. Watch children chase Anthony Perkins up a stairwell. <laughs> you know, I just watch these things. I love that it sequence. Unfold. It's great. It's also yeah. terrifying. Um, yeah. But you watch these things and let it unfold and don't get so caught up in well, what's the meaning behind that? Although there are interpretations of an actual meaning, or maybe there is a real good one. I don't know. I just stick to um, let's go mad with him, but know in the end that we're going to at least keep a sanity unlike him, unlike Joseph K. Unfortunately. Yeah. What yeah about like you? you know, when I first saw it, I, you know, I had a similar experience where it was more that I just enjoyed it so much and I didn't know why I was enjoying it. I mean, for one thing, it's extremely aesthetically pleasing, but as mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I never, and I'm sure you would agree that, you know, an, an, an aesthetic is never enough. Like it's, it's gotta, yeah. like, you know, I, I can hang a picture on my wall and like to look at it, but I don't necessarily want to watch a two hour movie of just a picture, <laughs> you know, a nice picture. Um, so I don't, I don't remember what I thought of it. All I remember is really enjoying it, really finding myself getting lost in it. Some of the scenes that really popped out to me was the one where he goes into it. Like, it looks like um, some kind of back closet with the, which were with the uh, two officers that initially interrogated him. And now they're like being whipped and they're stripped naked and they're blaming him for the fact that they're now getting uh, yeah. in trouble for the way they interrogated him. Um, I, there was something so emotional about it, even as he like, even as he gets out of the room and then one of them is like trying to grab him. Uh, I just felt so much for those men who off the top were like such monsters, which I just, I don't, I, you know, I can't even put words to it. It just, it's something that it, it's sort of, it's an intellectual film because as we said, you can like yeah. really think about the meaning, but then at the same time it plays in a really emotional way, which like you said, you can just kind of sit back and um, and just enjoy it for what it is, which is like a, a nightmare of a guy getting blamed for a crime. He he doesn't even know what the know. crime is. Yeah. And it's no idea. a death sentence, actually. Yeah. Yeah. He it's going to be he's he's guilty. Yeah. yeah. But I, you know, I think, I think the way, you know, I think our minds are just programmed that way. We hate to be like confused. We hate to feel that we don't understand something. So often people will either dismiss something they don't understand, or they'll like think and think and think and think. Um, so I think this is a film you kind of have to find a, a happy medium for, because if you're like, you could just get stuck in your head and even just doing this podcast, like I will find myself watching something and because I know I have to talk about it, I'm like, hang on a second, you know, and then I have to like stop and just, just, okay, just, you know, make your opinions later, you know, so um, I really try to, to resist that. But I, you know, I know I was reading a book recently, actually, I had the author on because she wrote a book, which I loved about the, the European cinema, uh, how, how it explored World War II. And yeah. this is a book, uh, this film came, came up in, and I, I had never really thought of any kind of a connection. She felt that you can look at it in the 60s, almost like an analogy for what happened to Jewish people in the Holocaust. Like they were, they were, people told them they were guilty because mm -hmm. of who they were, you know, so they stripped yeah. them of their identity and basically killed, killed many of them, you know, 6 million, 6 million of them. And you know, you look at this film and I can kind of see that interpretation because, you know, he already has this guy who is guilty, as he says to Jean Moreau early in the film. You know, if a, a teacher ever said to him, what did you do? How dare you have done that? And he, he would just automatically feel guilty. So he sort of already has this uh, guilt complex and everybody in the film, no one is like talking to him based on who he is in that moment or how he is, uh, you know, his anxiety or his confusion or his anger, they're all talking to him like he's guilty. Even Jean yeah. Moreau, she's like suspicious of him. She throws him out. Uh, the police officers, everyone like, and it's almost as if he's being made to believe 
that he did something and he doesn't, you know, so, so, and then, you know, of course at the end, like laughing at them as they kill him, which yeah. I know Wells, Wells said he intentionally did that because, you know, he felt that this is, you know, the book is written before the Holocaust and now we're making this after the Holocaust. And so he couldn't just have this guy go to his grave um, and, and be slaughtered. He wanted it to be laughing back at these, you know, these monsters um, which is, which is I, I, another scene that I always thought was unforgettable. And I never could quite put, you know, put my words as to what is so unforgettable about him. It's a combination of the performance and just, a, I think, uh, the power of the scene, this guy like laughing back at the people tr who are hurting him and stripping away his identity. And, um, so I can see that as a, as an analogy for that, but, you know, even well said, it's like a, you know, it's a it's a film like how the bureaucracy, the you know, the mm -hmm. bureaucratic yeah. systems are crush you and and, you know, con yeah. you and trick you, um, make you feel guilty because they ultimately want to, you know, destroy you. And 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 that I can see as well, because it's all about the law. You know, all these I love the, the everything is so big, like the buildings are huge. The mm -hmm. doors are huge. The desks are huge. Uh, occasionally, like some of the the shots, he just shoots from a very uh, wide angle, even if it's two people talking, and yeah. you just hear, and it's and he feels like so small in the frame. Uh, you know, all those desks of those people working, and which is such a, I thought visually that's stunning. Like it, it not only stunning, but it's so emotional because I, I think I believe in the book it's more that he's like caught in a lot of tight spaces, like cramped mm -hmm. and Wells mm -hmm. took it and just flipped it where he's in these massive spaces, but he looks so small. Uh, so he easily looks like someone he could just be stomped on. So there's, I, I, you know, I think, you know, those are both like, you know, wildly different views. And I think, yeah, you can, you could, you could say that you can see both of those things. Right. So I, I definitely can. I mean, it's, uh, and that's what's so great about this movie. It, it successfully made it to where you could take away a lot of interpretations that are unique to each other. And I mean, just the fact that you spoke about the Holocaust, there's a scene where he's walking with all these people who are yeah. they're, they're on clothes and they have, you know, signs around their neck and with the numbers so, on it. Yeah. That really yeah. popped out to me this time. Yeah. And so it's, there's that. And then there's another person that can just go, well, that was just odd. <laughs> and that yeah. it, but it's, um, it, you know, it's, it is interesting to be able to pull off and, you know, Orson Welles, he was such a, a master filmmaker that he was able to pull off a film that he actually wanted to, he considered as the darkest comedy of <laughs> like, he really he loves, like, he was like, I don't want to talk about Citizen Kane. I want to yeah. talk about Smile. Yeah. And so. And yeah, this was did, a favorite of his. It was. It was a, a huge favorite. And, yeah. um, and and the fact that it bombed, uh, he felt incredibly horrible about because of, of because of the movie and how much he loved it and all the passion that went into it. But what he spoke about the most was. Uh, Perkins his performance and just Perkins as a an actor and, and saying like he he did not deserve you know those uh those bad reviews he didn't deserve any of that yeah and um I, they did have a very close relationship um and they but yeah I'm veering off now into something else but it's just it, it is interesting to know that you have this director who says the darkest comedy and it, it it is it is funny in the way that it'll make you nervous and then you laugh uh, yeah. but um yeah it's there's tons of interpretations that could be taken away from it and that's i'm surprised he got such bad re review i don't see how you could give him a bad review perkins i mean his prefer even oh, if you oh, hate oh, the perkins. film the perkins is the perkins is i mean the the anxiety the <laughs> you know mm -hmm. the 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 anger like i like that he often was fighting back like that he has that great speech uh in front of like you know he suddenly goes into the room with uh, all the these frames, people the stills, yeah and yeah, yeah uh, and he's Orson just yelling Wolf. at everyone uh and oh, i yeah. yeah and even towards the end you know he's he's when he's with wells and he says you know what you just want me to 
to say I'm I'm mad, don't you? Isn't that what you know? And it's and it, it looks very much like Lady from Shanghai. It's a very similar. Some of the some yeah. of the shots are very similar. Um, but I don't see how you could give him a bad rating, even if you hate the movie. I mean, the performance is so great. Well, I mean, true. Uh, it, I'll start with that. You know, it's just like with Perkins. I think he didn't, uh, well, first off, he was given the direction by Wells to, he, he said like, okay, are we going to play him guilty or not guilty? Or we're going to go in between a little bit here and kind of make it a, a gray area where we don't know, but we're winking here, winking over yeah. there. You yeah. Know? And, uh, but Wells, he came back and he said, no, he absolutely is guilty. He <laughs> I is love that. Guilty. I could yeah, just see so, him saying okay. that too. He's guilty as hell, Anthony. I could just see him like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. so he, it's a, uh, it was that. I think it really did make him go like. Uh, it kind of gave him a little bit of pause uh, because he wanted to play it differently. And but he trusted Wells, and he worked with Wells uh, after uh, in this movie called Ten Days Wonder by Claude Chabrol. And so they had a good relationship even after this movie had bombed and bad reviews and all that stuff. Um, yeah. And uh, there is something that I did know, uh, or I do know, I did know, I, I once knew. Um, but uh, it was the fact that he didn't Wells, uh, Wells, he didn't know that he was gay. And so he used that a little bit to his advantage to put in his performance. Oh, and wow. because there's lots of women that are offering themselves to uh, Joseph K. And yeah. it was that, as you said, that anxiousness, that, you know, tick ridden sort of behavior where he's, you know, moving his hands as he did in Psycho and that kind of stays. But then you see that he, tra he, he completely transforms into two different people. He's that tick ridden guy. And then he's the guy who's in that courtroom. Who's like pointing his finger, yeah. you know, arm, shoulders back. He's like really in control and authoritative and yeah. confident. Yeah. So it is, uh, I think that may have been, I like to think that was a little bit of Perkins saying that we're going to try to sp sprinkle some stuff in. So, you know, it doesn't feel one note or just one shade of like, if he was like this the whole time, well, I don't know, officer, then uh, you're, he's guilty. He's very guilty. And that would kind of remove the, the lovely crazy uh, rabbit hole uh, trip that it is. So that, uh, so th that's an interesting story. So like, are, what was it, was it that Wells, knew that he was like like it was open between them that Perkins was gay and so he was gonna oh like like he said to him well you know it's as if these women are seducing you and you you don't want to tell them that you're gay so that's where the anxiety came in yeah and then also fear of exposure of being you know a, a secret being revealed uh I like see. You know, I see. this person's you know uh joseph k he's being charged with he does not know what and they're kind of implying you know and oh so, i see like, i see different aspects, aspects of that so it's uh but yeah i mean uh, everybody did know in the industry back then and that's one of the reasons why he did fly out to europe to work and where this was shot so and takes place uh so yeah it's uh it, i think that wells he welcomed it instead of like exploited it or took advantage of it oh wow okay that's interesting yeah. i didn't i didn't know that i was curious you know what did you because sometimes again you know you 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 can't help but try to to wonder about some of the functions of the characters and the various women you know jean moreau uh romy schneider well romy uh, schneider she's great i remember yeah she's great and just falling in love with her i was like whoa who is she and she's very beautiful and she and when they fall down and a piece of, like all of the newspapers and everything it's just a, it is very like this it's shot in a very like you were saying uh emotional it's it's strangely romantic at the same time yeah while also creepy. but yeah you were saying about the uh, mechanics of the character right well, just a note on on Schneider. It was it was. I mean, uh, Wells made me laugh. I don't know. Have you have you seen like the that hour and a half where he goes to a university to talk about this film on YouTube? 
It's been a minute. Refresh my memory. Give me a refresher. But it's like, because, you know, he plays like the uh, uh, lawyer in this film. And he said he, he didn't want to because, you know, he's already the writer. He's the director. I mean, not that he hadn't done that before where he was like Citizen Kane, where he's also co-writer of that and the director. Uh, but he, he didn't want to do it again. And then he because he couldn't get he couldn't get anyone. Um, he said, he said, well, once I saw Romy Schneider in the white nurse outfit, I was, I just enjoyed it. I just thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> uh, but then, but, but the other female, yeah, Elsa Martinelli, who was mm. the third, um, awesome. I'm not too familiar with her. I, I was curious what you felt the, the purpose of those three women were. I, I, I was curious what you thought that was about. I don't know. <laughs> I, no I don't know. Because this book, it, the, the book, the movie, I mean, yeah, people take away their, it's not like I sat back and I'm just like, I don't know what's going on. Does anybody? It's like, I really just, uh, I mean, I think that I honestly don't know. It's just, I don't. This movie, it really, the main thing for me is just like, there's so many well it's, a, it's such a nightmare that it's hard to yeah. say like and sometimes well, you're like what are they talking about you yeah, know like just like i i i mean i'm gonna botch this but i can tell a liar by looking at the lines of his lips i believe is one of the di that's the dialogue and and i can and it's just it's yeah and he, and he says that to everyone too he's like oh mm -hmm. it's when he starts to go really crazy oh you, you could tell i'm guilty by the lines of my lips right or the way yeah, my lips yeah. move towards yeah, the end it's just there's stuff like that that is like gets piled and piled and piled up and then there's contradictions it's like it, there's little things to me as a viewer I felt always that okay we're going to guide you in this direction we're going to give you a little bit of something to chew on and then we're going to immediately like turn you the other way and we're going to kind of dismiss this and not that it felt like you know, there was, it, it wasn't consistent or tangible. It was like, there's so many contradictions in here that it's like, um, you know, it, it's like any movie, uh, what was that one movie? Um, there must be a movie that is just filled with contradictions that you just set, you just sit back and you just go, okay, I get what they're doing here. And that's how I see it. But yeah. I know a lot of, I know like, you know, when it comes to, uh, the justice system there's there are stuff in here i don't feel like it's actual themes that are being threaded through as like you know okay this is our first theme this is our second theme this is the stuff that we're really really touching upon as a whole i feel like you can look at yeah yeah, yeah you can look at it like this is a man like you said who's going mad who's going crazy is he guilty is he not guilty he's he's charged with a crime that we do not know of yeah. And we're not, he doesn't know. And that he gets this lawyer who is this old man lying in a bed. And it's just, it gets weirder and weirder by the moment because it's this feverish nightmare that he's going through and let's go through it with him. Yeah. And by the end, it's, they can't, they can't, uh, they can't, well, well they're going to either slice his neck or do something with a knife they had a knife but these two men with perkins they couldn't do it they get out of this pit with all these rocks but before putting him in this this uh pit with rocks they actually take a jacket and they fold the jacket and they put it as a pillow under his head yeah i noticed that down. Yeah, so there's like a ton of stuff in here that, and they're like taking the knife, passing it, which yeah. way. It's like, who should do it. it? Yeah. Who should do it? They get out of there, and then suddenly a freaking explosive just gets thrown in, and he's yeah. laughing before. But yeah. it's just like, oh my gosh. I, I kind of thought that they were like made to like distract him. Like it was almost as if, particularly the uh, Elsa, the, the third woman, because you know and they say similar things to him not so much john moreau but the romy schneider and the the other woman because they're like they're like oh you know we'll make love later or you could do whatever you want like within seconds and he's kind of like what are you talking about but then there there was that there was that other guy who kept walking closer and closer and he kept looking as he was kissing one of the women he goes oh this must be a trap so i thought it was almost as if 
you know, like the temptress trying to, oh, okay. to, yeah. to draw I mean, him that's... in and then, and then snatch him, <laughs> you know, when yeah. he's, uh, you know, when he's, when he's not looking. And it, it kind of reminds me of, you know, it made me really think about what Wells said when he talked about like, yeah, you know, it's, it, it's like the bureaucratic system, these, you know, monsters trying to hang on to their, uh, to their way of life. And it, it kind of reminded me about how people are often conned uh, into like voting for certain politicians who like do not have your best interests. And it's almost, it's almost as if, you know, it's almost as if they find a way to make you feel guilty about the way you live. You know, you, you hear often yeah. politicians. I live in America, Robert. Yeah, exactly. You Especially there. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it, we, we have simil similarities, but, but yeah, yeah, it's often, it's often in the States. It's like, yeah, you, you do know, not uh, get Trump into office. <laughs> you, yeah. You don't have that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, we have similar populists types, but that pretend they're anti-establishment, but they're very much the establishment. Um, but it's, you know, it's sort of reminded me of like, you know, when you look at like I know in the States, the minimum wage is like really low and often uh, I, it was just raised to like fifteen dollars, I think. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm wrong about that, that just makes insert, me insert in the Beverly Hills girl grew up in the industry. <laughs> no. yeah. yeah. In certain it's states. Cool. In certain states. Yeah. Certain but states. I know for like a long like like for the longest time it was like eight bucks. Maybe in some states it is still like yeah, nine, but no. yeah, definitely. But yeah. It, but it's often it's often like, oh well, you know, well, your job sucks anyway. And and I've seen that here too, because then people do think, oh, well, I guess what I I guess what I'm doing in my life is not good enough. So I, so I shouldn't complain. Yeah, I guess my job is low, uh, uh, you know, not worth much. And then it's like, yeah, but it's like, hey, why would you, why do you, why do you think that is the case? You're, you're, you're contributing to whatever it is that you're doing. You're putting in 40 hours a week or whatever. Yeah. And I've, I've even seen those arguments here. It's, you know, it's like, well, maybe the, maybe these people should just go do a trade or they should just do something else. And it's like, yeah, but that doesn't fix the problem because though you're still going to have to fill that vacancy, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, now it's interesting that people say, oh, the, the frontline workers are heroes, but yet they will turn around and say that that job is crap, uh, particularly in grocery stores. So, I mean, I know that this is sort of off topic, but I, I think it, no, no, it, it, it fits, it ties in. Completely. Yeah. Yeah. It certainly does. Cause it, it just like those see, and then even of course the fable off the top, you know, mm -hmm. where it's like yeah. the guy who waited to get into the system. He's like, oh, I've been waiting. I want to get in to see the law. And he's like, well, you know, you, sorry, you can't. You'll have to wait. And he waits till he's dead. And then he's like, oh, hey, actually, this door was only for you. No one else was allowed in. And now I can close it. And that's clearly a lie. They clearly tricked him. They clearly conned him. And I thought it reminds me of like the myth of the American dream, right? It's all yeah, like... No, Absolutely. Like I was yeah. just about to say that, like it, it is the American, the American dream. I could see that now. I mean, it's really, it really is touched upon about the deceptive. Uh, yeah, exactly. Of the that's, American I think that's dream. what the women represented in it. It's really oh, interesting. Okay. I need to wash it again then. <laughs> but, um, but no, it's just like, it, it is true. Cause that even at the end, he says, Perkins, he says to Wells, uh, before he dies, he says that I am a member of society. Yeah. And yeah. there's this, he asks too, he asks him, uh, do you think that you're, you're a member of society or he gives some sort of like accusation and he says, I am a member of society. Yeah. And it felt like in this way that whole part that ending it felt like a, a need to conform and at least some parts uh, a need to conform a need to be a member of society you know a need to be able to have that 401k and you know all these different things to and the american dream sets us up to where it is so effortless it is so uh there's so much to be had and it's all for everybody um when it's not entirely true you know there's exactly. it's not true at all it's it's you know labor intensive work that people do not get paid enough for um exactly. so they want yeah. more hours to get paid and then do it you know, to make rent yeah and yeah. it's um 
it's it is utterly unfair the american dream um and incredibly dangerous and it's 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 crazy like with politicians that are just car- carnival barkers how it's perpetrated yeah. today and yeah. still just perpetrated of we will sell you and uh, we will have a world of or america of false promises or we will have a america of like the best sweet sounding words yeah. and it's like but no no that's not how it goes i mean yeah. you, and the American dream can go into different things other than politics. I mean, just the fact that like me growing up in Beverly Hills, I mean, that is also the American dream. That's fun there in Beverly Hills to where you have people in the Midwest actually believing that the streets are paved with gold in Beverly Hills. It's not the case. It's definitely not the case. Like there's no gold there. Um, on, you're driving and you just see gold. What you see actually is you have rats, sewer rats and mansions. And you also, you, and the reason for those rats is because the city will find you if you put your trash bins out on the street in front of your house, you have to put it in the back alley. And that's where the rats come and then they come into the house. So everything on the outside looks perfect. Right, and that's right. really much like the American dream to me, you know, everything yeah. on the outside, everything, you know, surface level, it yeah. looks because it's being sold as perfect. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. And, so, and you can, you can say that about the aesthetic of the film too, because like mm-hmm. even those like gigantic statues, like everything outside the, the quote unquote law, like the, what, as yeah. they call it in the film looks amazing. And then when you're in there, it's like, just these stacks of papers everywhere and it's like all the different people who have probably been arrested and even like laws uh wells says there's a line early in the film when you first see him and then he says well we're gonna you know we're gonna we're gonna say what his plea is he goes well sometimes they say the plea and it gets just gets filed away and no one can remember it he (laughs) says and i just thought yeah because it's all uh it's a scam it's a it's a trick it's a con and it reminded me of uh, what Wells said, which which I'm not sure how much I noticed it because he he felt that Kay, who Perkins plays as a guy who's like trying to like climb the same ladder mm-hmm. like this of the law, the, the bureaucratic system. And I know he's like he's like a bank clerk and obviously he works in that, you know, you see him at work with like tons of, of desks. But when he sits down to actually work, the clock goes off and then he gets right up like the moment he sits down the it goes okay work's done and everybody gets up and he's like all right like he's it, the moment he actually gets to work sorry i cut you off but like that yeah that has to be said yeah yeah that yeah that, yeah exactly you know i actually i forgot about that we and, and it goes to the fable off the top of like this guy trying to get in and he's lied to and basically uh waits till he dies to get in um and it just reminded me of how like you know as as much as and and i'm and i do this myself as much as we complain um about these systems that we often know exploit us you know but then people still admire like you know no offense to kim kardashian but like admire these people who are born into like such privilege and have just recently had the goal to say that people have to go out and work if they want what they want and I'm like, yeah. what, <laughs> what do you realize the privilege that you were born into? Like that you're mm-hmm. only where you are because you were already born into this privilege system, very much like the people in, in uh, the trial were yeah, likely no, she, already she just they're a product know of what it. Privilege she's born into. She does yeah. know that something's between her teeth and that's a silver spoon. And yeah, that's exactly, spoon. exactly. Which is, which is often, you know, people never realize uh yeah. how lucky they all you know how much advantages they have or else they're gonna feel they're gonna feel like they don't <laughs> deserve it and they want to feel very much like they do deserve it and and you you see that in the film that like gets vague right but it's like it, it's somewhat there even towards the end like the kid scene i love that with the paint and he's like going to talk to the painter who painted all the judges and i love that because he's like well, you know, I could talk to him. I could probably say you're innocent, but they're only at a lower code cord. You got to go to the higher chords. And that's when Perkins just starts to give up. You know, he's just like, oh my God, you're telling me that there's more judges. I've got to 
talk to even Romy Schneider, like when they're looking at the paintings of the judges and she's like, Oh, look out. They always make themselves look so great and so large. And, mm-hmm. and it's, yeah. and I was like, yeah, because they see themselves that way. Um, yeah, they see themselves as, as big shots. Right. So it's pretty interesting. I mean, you could, we could, you know, you can go really go down a rabbit hole in this film, you know, <laughs> yeah. and with all but sorts of comparisons. Yeah. yeah. With all kinds of comparisons, but, uh, uh, but then, like we said, you can, you can just equally enjoy it as uh, a guy who doesn't know what he's accused of. And it's a surreal nightmare uh, because nightmares never make sense, you know, and, and, I think that's probably why Wells off the top said there, there's no logic to this story. He's almost giving everybody a warning in the voiceover, yeah. you know, and I think that was a good idea. I think, you know, I know occasionally directors do that. And I think sometimes that is a good idea just to be like, all right, guys, like just, just enjoy the ride. Yeah. just sit back. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is, it's good because uh, it's, it's really, it is a nice little heads up that he did there. And also if anybody is just confused or if they're um, frustrated a little bit, then the movie's doing its job. And the movie is exactly. definitely engaging that person. And yeah. if they're questioning, confused, if they're going, what is going on? Then it's doing its job either way, you know, whether it's yeah. uh, reading well, there, into yeah interpretation or it's everything that you said that I agree with and um and then you know it's just or it's just sitting back and watching no matter what the movie is uh, a master class at being able to touch upon so many different things but do its job no matter what uh because we all walk away with different and subjective you know so totally. it's subjective so we all walk away with something else or a different emotion that we project or something and uh, what have you. But by the end of it, this movie is it still sets out to do one thing and it does it. And yeah. so it's great. Yeah. Yeah. No, well said. I mean, you very much feel like him because you feel a little mad trying to figure out. Well, all we all the feel things. a little mad sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All trying to figure out. And I, and I honestly think no. that if, uh, uh, I honestly think that if they had if they had had some kind of reveal, like, mm-hmm. and I think in a conventional Hollywood story, it would have been like, you know, half oh, yeah. three quarters of the way through, they would tell everybody the mysteries. And here it's like, which which goes into the humor of the film is like, no, we're not going to tell you. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. ha ha. <laughs> and maybe that's part of the laugh too. I don't know. Maybe Perkins and Wells were on set one day, and they're just like, "I really crank up that laugh." You know, crank it yeah. up before you die because we're going to be laughing at them too. Like, what? you know, the, this movie's going to end, and you're going to be like, "What?" And and apparently they were like having a ball doing this. I'm not. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure you yeah. read that in your research. Like, they yeah. were laughing the whole. So there's even some stills of them like on set like oh, laughing their ass off up. yeah <laughs> like Perkins leaning over cracking up I mean that guy can bend uh yeah oh my yeah, god yes uh, that would... but yes uh, <laughs> it's... <laughs> no. Uh, no pun intended <laughs> you gotta keep that I don't yeah. I don't know it's a little controversy is okay over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> from my mouth yeah, yeah i didn't say it <laughs> <laughs> hi guys um all right yeah um so as you were <laughs> <laughs> was there was there anything else that when you researched like perkins in general about this film that really stood out to you as as because as we said uh you know perkins did not care for it he thought it was like a mess no. So yeah. what mean, did, did anything pop out to you that you found really interesting? He was, uh, till the, well, what popped out to me that was interesting is that uh, he was very, somebody close to him told me that he uh, was very, very bitter about his career near the end. And Friendly Persuasion, uh, his first movie, and Psycho, were the only movies that he felt were very, very good movies and uh, near the end of his life. And so uh, he was, he looked back with such a bitter lens that he was just like, 
everything that went wrong on those sets, including the trial. And even though you can look at pictures that are not staged and he's laughing and you can look at pictures of, uh, you could see that in different interviews um, and, and he promoted it. He, he was happy to work with Wells and he was happy with the movie. You know, he knew it was weird. He knew that's Kafka. He was very, he was a reader, an avid reader. Um, so he knew what he was signing up for and he knew that he wanted to work with the best directors and he had that experience. But what stood out to me the most was the fact that even <clears throat> till the end of his life, he just, he held on to only two movies and everything else was just hmm. shoddy work. Yeah. It's interesting. It's a, yeah. Yeah. That's it's, he it's would do, like extensive rehearsals and, and down, I mean, I think like he would be so nitpicky. That's how bitter he got. Uh, he got, and you know, rightfully so for somebody who is uh, needed to keep his sexuality a secret. And also, you know, he is the fact that he has AIDS a secret and keep working. Um, so yes. he felt very, very bitter about the industry and probably that, you know, started to seep into his filmography. And he just didn't care as much, but he, he kept working, he kept working. And I think because that passion was always there. And, um, but yeah, I mean, he, uh, I remember he, his lines were dubbed by Wells and, uh, and he went, I don't care. Like, I don't care. I don't care if it was dubbed, but then I heard from somebody that he actually didn't in fact care. He, it's oh. like this weird thing of like before he didn't care and then near the end he really did harp on it i can't harp even i can't it. even i you you can tell that other actors are dubbed i actually think it was interesting because it did something to the sound it made the sound yeah. feel like it, is, yeah. it almost like echoed at times like it, it almost ha had an element of like like a nightmare like it was really creepy yeah. like it, I, I don't you know i don't know if it was just the dubbing or if he if he did something to the sound like it almost seems like he raised the volume of the sound. I don't know, but it, it really works. But I never could tell he dubbed Perkins. It always just sounded like I, Perkins. I can't tell. I remember being so keen on finding, like, where's Wells? I mean, I know that he was a good impersonator, but come on. And yeah. I I just, I kept hearing Perkins. And so Same. I I don't know. Uh, but he was told that, but then eventually, like, like I said, he didn't care and then he cared. It was, uh, it, that was interesting to me throughout all, all of the research is the fact that he harped on uh, something that was obviously a good experience, but it just, it felt, he was filtering it through the experiences he was going through in the moment, which, you know, he's trying to get work while he's dying. Right. And he became fed up with the industry, much like how Joseph K becomes fed up with the system and yeah. with all the lies around him. And right. so, yeah, I think that fear of exposure, a lot of his movies too, Perkins, he was able to emotionally grab onto something that connected to him, like fear of exposure uh, in the trial. Right. Oh, and that's interesting. Yeah. Being charged with something and, you know, him feeling like he's been put on the stand so many times to go, you know, down to having to sign a, a, a confidentiality agreement between Paramount and himself to never see Tab Hunter at any men. And so wow. he was definitely crucified. And, uh, like I said, then he moved to Europe. That was one of the big reasons. It's like, I got to get out of here. Yeah. And not just because I'm typecast as Norman Bates, but I got to get out of here and I got to see what other roles I can do other than that people in Europe will look at me and say, yeah, come on over instead yeah. of going, wait, let's have a meeting about what I know about you and yeah. let's get this under wraps, um, you know, keep it at the door, uh, right. Tony. And so, yeah, I mean, Psycho is another one that fit into his own personality and his own lifestyle of, you know, keeping a secret. And it, a lot of that is. A mm. It's story. interesting. I never dawned on me. Yeah. But that's, that's a good, there's an inter some interest. I could see how he could really Down bite into those dad roles. Dying at five, like Norman Bates's dad died at yeah. five and same with Perkins and same with the mom, the overbearing mom. Perkins had an overbearing mother. 
and you know an abusive one too and it's just like there were so many things that just checked off and with psycho he just he went into that so much like he did with the trial and, and really invested yeah. himself emotionally yeah it's 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 almost there's you know it, i i you know wells also was someone who like the system often hollywood system often rejected him because he yep. wanted to do these like great like films that were very artistic in a system that doesn't value that right so he went i mean he went to europe partly also to escape the blacklist and yeah. um and also because you two guys who can definitely relate to each other you yeah yeah together, for sure together and be like yeah i hate it too and but i'm glad that we're here and we got funding you know let's yeah. go shoot in a very beautiful place in paris yeah. yes yeah which and apparently the way wells got i forget who he said he met some you know people who were like wanted to invest in films who were very very wealthy and they gave him a list of like 80 books he could adapt <laughs> or just ideas or something and oh, yeah. he he looked through the list and he's like okay i'll go with the trial i thought that was interesting that that's how this happens you know they were like okay just pick out of this 80 <laughs> it's, it's yeah it is crazy i think that you could just get a list and then suddenly you're like the trial yeah i'm gonna yeah. do that yeah. I know that Perkins, he was so uh, influenced and moved by Wells that when he directed Psycho 3, he did take a lot of inspiration from direct or being directed by Wells, which was down to, I would never do this as a director, but when I heard it, it was uh, Wells would tell uh, Tony, you have to will yourself to dream the sequence before shooting it. You have to will yourself. And I like, he did that in Psycho 3. And he's like, this is, you know, the, this particular scene in uh, Psycho 3, I dreamt it, I shot it, and I did exactly what Wells, you know, told me. Um, and I found that to be moving. I mean, I would never, I would never do that as I, I wouldn't sit down and be, I, how do you will yourself to dream a sequence? I mean, yeah. just kind of go like this. I, don't know, <laughs> I know that's a weird direction. It is, <laughs> but it's like, and that was Perkins. That was Perkins to like, you know, one day, Robert, we'll get into like the idiosyncratic behavior of Perkins and why it's so much in his work. Um, and it's just like a, a definite imprint on his persona as an actor. And also because it's it's him and, uh, you know, down to spirituality and all the different drugs he, you know, experimented in, all different things that down to willing yourself to dream a sequence. Um, hmm. He was very, uh, yeah. Uh, Joseph K, he's uh, obviously <laughs> going through it. He's going through hell, but uh, at the same time, uh, he has something. He has something up there that he knows. I right. always feel that, that I do not know. And uh, he's privy to something uh, and that I'm not. And I feel like that was Perkins uh, pretty much summed up. When when are we going to be able to hear more about this biopic or is that still under wraps? Yeah, you're the, you're the <laughs> first one to know. You're the first one to know. It's my stock reply and I'm sticking to it. Now it's, it is moving. It's definitely moving. And uh, there is an interesting development that has taken place that's being wrapped up. Uh, I will be... Will I be able to? I don't know. I mean, I sh sure, maybe, maybe <laughs> I will be able to talk about it. Um, I think I, I maybe, maybe, uh, yes, uh, no, maybe. Uh, so <laughs> no pressure. That's, that's you know, I, I'm shooting something that night that is a 1950s, or I'm I'm in post and I'm wrapping something that's a 1950s period piece. Yes. And so I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Great. Yeah. And where is the best place for people to follow your work? I know it's mainly Instagram, right? It's, I only got one social media app because, you know, I'm tired of floating in too big of a cesspool. Uh, at Janae underscore Ballo. That's how you do it. Great. Yeah, that's right. There yeah. we go. <laughs> so I will leave the link in the description box below for where you can get in touch and follow Janae on all of the films that she's working on and web series. 
Shanae, thanks again. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for taking yeah, the time out. We got to do another one. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you are interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, head over to the link patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. Patreon is bonus content that I create month in and month out. And it is based on polls that I put out at the beginning of every single month, which you will vote on, which means you will be very much a part of the decision making as to what I record on my Patreon month in and month out. Patreon is also a great way for creators like myself to earn an, in earn an income so that we can create even more free content on platforms like YouTube and the audio version of my podcast. So if you like my work and you're interested in supporting me over on Patreon, head over to the link for full details. And if you are currently listening to this on the audio version of the podcast and you've run out of episodes to listen to, head over to the YouTube channel where every single episode that I've ever created can be found because there's only so many on the audio version youtube.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. And if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing to my channel by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo. You will see it floating above my head in the top left corner to your top left in just a second. Just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new videos or when I go live. Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you in the next episode.